Today, we have probably one of my most favorite preachers uh, ever. And uh, Chris and Sarah are pastor of the church in Auckland. He, they are ordained with the Assemblies of God. They've got uh, uh, two girls and one boy. And they've got uh, two grandchildren, one coming. <laughs> so they're grandparents, but they've been here before. And uh, Chris teaches the scriptures online, uh, expository preaching, and uh, probably uh, one of my favorite preachers. And uh, they had a good time with the young people, those that were able to be there on Friday. And they're here this morning, and uh, it's great to have them come and be with us. Can you stand to your feet? Give them a great hand. Thank you, Pastor Eliafi and Pastor Fia and the eldership for uh, allowing us to spend this morning with you. We're very humbled to be here, as always, and uh, we don't take our being here lightly and uh, trust that the Lord uh, will speak to you this morning. My wife, Sarah, uh, Asked if she wanted to say anything. She's she's very nervous. So, uh, and we pastor the Dream Centre Church in Papatoetoe in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, she's Samoan. My mother is Maori. My father is Samoan. And uh, born here in uh, New Zealand. So, praise God. Have your Bibles with you. Let's go right to the beginning of Scripture, to Genesis chapter 1. <coughs> what does it mean to exist? That's a good question. What does it mean to have your heart beat on average, 70 to 75 times a minute. What does it mean for you to draw 23,000 breaths on average in a day? What does it mean to exist? When I answer that question, we go right back to the very beginning of Scripture, to the book of Genesis, because there we find the beginning of existence. I want to unpack that a little bit and just look at Genesis a little bit and how significant and how important Genesis is in positioning it within the very beginning of Scripture and how it launches us into the biblical story. So I'm going to use all of Genesis chapter 1, but for the sake of time I'll read some of it. I'm assuming that most of us, if not all of us, have read the book of Genesis, especially Genesis chapter 1. And then we're going to look a little bit at Genesis chapter 2 and let's see how it goes with time this morning. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw it, saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Verse 31, at the end of Genesis chapter 1, Then God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. 
and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. It's interesting that God rested. What does that mean? Was he tired? We often use the word rest to describe our states when we're tired or weary. And here is God who is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent. He's resting from his work. Hmm. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, God created what is known as an ordered system. In God's ordered system, everything, everything, everything was being and doing what God created it to be and do. That's what God meant when he said, let there be light. Be the light that God created you to be. That's the standard. Don't bring anyone else's standard. Don't bring anyone else's light. When God created the light, he created it to be the light that he created it to be. You see, marriage is an ordered system. The husband is being the husband that God created him to be. And the wife is being the wife that God created her to be. Then that's the ordered system. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And we often stop there. But the scriptures continue to go on to say, and died for her. Now you imagine every marriage, every woman whose husband would, loves her so much that he's willing to die for her. Wives, respect, reverence your husbands. You see, it's hard for a woman to reverence a man that does not love her. And it's hard for a man to love a woman that does not reverence her. This is God's ordered system. When we are being what God created us to be and doing what God created us to do. Family is God's ordered system. Parents, train your children up in the ways of the Lord. Why? Because one day your son and your daughter, they're going to become adults. If you train them up in the ways of the Lord, when they become older, they will not depart from it. Children, honor your mother and your father. When parents are raising their children up in the ways of the Lord and children are honoring their parents, that's God's ordered system. We are being the families that God created us to be. Doing what God created us to do. Your body is an ordered system. Imagine a heart that's not doing what God created it to do. Imagine your lungs. They're not being what God created them to be. You don't need every organ in your body to malfunction. You just need one. Your heart's playing up or your heart is not doing what God created to do. Well, we all know the, the outcome of that. And so when you traverse the landscape of uh, humanity, what you find is that there are all these ordered systems. Well, creation was an ordered system. God, was, the, the intelligent designer, was designing everything perfectly in place. Giving it his perfect fingerprint and their design. The Old Testament was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. Now, we may not get through this all this morning. We'll probably finish it in the next session. Next service. It was written to ancient Israel in a way that they understood. It wasn't written to us. But it was written to ancient Israel in a way that they understood. Ancient Israel did not understand creation based on a material or a physical existence. They understood creation based on its function. They believed that something existed not by virtue of its material properties, but by virtue of it fulfilling a function within an ordered system. Wow. God's creation was physically and materially perfect, 
But the most important thing to God was a thing's function. This challenges a common church practice where the church often measures its, its success in material terms. By the size of our congregations, by the size of our buildings, and by the size of our budget. Remember the church inside us? Watch what God says to the church inside us. I know your deeds. I know your existence. That you have a name and you are alive. But then he goes and says, but you're dead. Now, how can you have a name? How can you have a reputation and be alive and be a buzzing church full of activity? And yet God says, you're a dead church. Function. Now, it doesn't mean buildings and all that stuff is not important. It was never the priority in the eyes of God. It's function. Wow. It's interesting that Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 teaches us that pre-creation material existed. And this astounded me when I, I, I discovered this. Watch God's starting point to his creation. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. A word study of the Hebrew Bible uses, shows that the words for formless and void are the words tohu and wabohu. It's interesting that when God creates the heavens and the earth, he doesn't start from nothing. His starting point is without form, void, and darkness. You kind of have to ask yourself, that if, if you're an avid student of the scriptures, you ask, my Bible college lecturer said, always ask good questions. In fact, it's harder to ask a good question than an easy one. Why does he start there? And how does that starting point travel through the biblical story. Tohu and wabohu do not mean nothingness. Because we often think this is, there's nothing, it's just non-existent. But they mean wasteland, wilderness, results of destruction, and no purpose of meaning. Therefore, tohu and wabohu, void, without form and darkness, imply material present that is present, but has no function or order. Watch this. Therefore, the pre-creation pre -creation situation exists in a state of disorder and dysfunction. God's starting point was not order or function. It was disorder and dysfunction. Therefore, God's creation process is a creative activity where God is bringing function and order to material that is dysfunctional and in disorder. Amazing grace, how sweet that sound, that saved the rich like me. I once was what? Lost. You were in disorder and dysfunction. But now I'm found. You're now in order and function. I once was blind. You were in disorder and dysfunction. But now I see. God has brought order and function. Now that's the church. <clears throat> the Hebrew word for create is the word bara, which simply means God created everything with a function and a purpose. Right. So that everything God created had a function and a purpose, and its value was found in how it functioned within the ordered system. Why the blues win last night? <laughs> ordered system. <laughs> I mean, everybody was just doing what they were supposed to be doing. And the team was doing it both independently but also interactively. That's how you win games. 
You don't need every person in your team to fail. You just need one. Now, if your goal is 100% production and you have 10 people, or well, we'll stay with the rugby team, 15 people within the team, then every person in that team's got to do something like 7% of the work. But it's still a 100% goal of production. You have one person that's not performing, the other 14 now have got to carry the 100%. You've got two, now the other 13 are going to have to carry the 100%. And you have three that are not performing, you now the other 12 are going to carry the 100%. Why is it that people burn out in church? We often say, oh, because you're doing too much work. No, you're not. It's because the people you're working with are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And you have had to carry their load for them. I remember playing rugby, Ben, Pastor Ben, and our coach was a player coach for this particular game. And, and I was, you know, I'd play rugby games without even touching the ball. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you've been in that. I've played a whole game where I didn't get to touch the ball. Um, and I remember I was dawdling on the rugby field. I was tired, and, and all I could hear behind me was my rugby coach going, get there, get there, get there. And, and uh, I called him get there from there on because um, <laughs> he understood biblical principles. Uh, we understand that. Hallelujah. Genesis teaches us that everything God said, God saw, and it was good. But what does the Bible mean by the, it was good? What made it good? How was it good? What did it do in order for it to be good? Genesis 2 verse 18 answers that very question by telling us what was not good. God said these words, it is not good that man be alone. The verse has nothing to do with physical or material attributes of Adam. It is a statement concerning Adam's function. Adam's function was this. God created Adam, then he placed him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep the garden. That's what his function was. But it was obvious from the, the, the text that he could not do this on his own. So God set out immediately, watch this, wherever there's disorder or dysfunction, fix it straight away. Don't delay. You don't solve it, fix it now. It's going to fester and get worse. And God understood that. And so what does God do? He fixes Adam's dysfunction by creating for Adam Eve. And when he gives a Adam Eve to Adam, he doesn't call Eve his wife. He says, he doesn't say, he's your wife, or he's your fiancé, or he's your girlfriend. He says, here's your helper, suitable. What do you mean, helper suitable? She's there to help him function. He can't do the job on his own. It's interesting that Adam needed Eve more than Eve needed Adam. In fact, the only reason why Eve was created for Adam was because Adam couldn't do the job on his own. Now, there's heaps of sermons on, on, for women right there. <laughs> the word helper suitable in Hebrew means Aza Kenegdo. Aza, as if God himself was helping them. It wasn't just any kind of help. It's as if God himself was helping him. Well, Kinecto means equally compatible. In other words, Eve was not subservient to Adam, neither was she superior to him, and him to her as well. And so in giving Adam a helper suitable or an Asa Kinecto, God was helping Adam to now function and be the man of God that he and now his wife were called to be. In fact, Eve exponentially multiplied Adam's capacity to do the work of God. What is the original purpose of marriage? I've heard this question, and I've answered, I've preached this at many weddings, many, but a lot of people say, well, it's love. You do. If you love someone, marry them. Okay. Procreation, have children, so you can have children. Okay. When you look at Scripture, 
the, the original purpose and reason why marriage was created was for mission. To do the work of God. Adam couldn't do it on his own. He needs a wife to help him do the work of God. And so when you're looking for your husband or your future wife, don't worry about the looks. They don't last. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry about the muscles or the body. Trust me. <laughs> Everything changes. But the original purpose for marriage, from reading this, this, the text, is mission. Wow. And so Eve multiplies him, his capacity, to the point that God says, now go into all the earth, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over everything that God move, that, that moves on the face of the earth. And so now they've been called out of the garden together to go into the earth and to have complete dominion over everything. This is all in chapter 1. Well, we get to understand chapter 1, we get to understand chapter 2, we get to understand chapter 3, we get to understand the entire book of Revelation of Genesis right through to the cross. Wow. After God had fixed the problem, he saw that everything was very good, meaning everything was functioning both independently and interactively. And so in God's ordered system, everything is doing what it's doing, created to do and be independently, but also interactively. You've got people that are great independently, but can't get on in a team. They're not team people. And in God's ordered system, everything is independently, but also interactively. Hallelujah. We're all right this morning. Very quiet. <laughs> the ancient reader would have concluded that the creation narrative was a temple text telling a temple story and that day seven was the most important of the seven days. When God created the heavens and the earth, he wasn't just creating the cosmos. He was building a cosmic temple. Watch this. Creation is a cosmic temple from which he would both live and rule. He wasn't building something and then disconnecting himself from it. He was building something so that he can enter into it. God wants to be a part of the journey. This is how ancient Israel would have understood the creation story. So that when Genesis chapter 2 tells us that God rested, they knew that God rested only in a temple. This is the understanding. This is what temples were built for. They were a place for divine rest. So that the creation of the heavens and the earth was in fact the construction of a cosmic temple and the seventh day was the inauguration of that temple. It wasn't until God had created everything good and very good that he rested. In other words, he put everything in order. Then he rested. If you don't put everything in order, you will never rest. How many of you know you can go for a holiday overseas and if your family back home, your children back home are not in order, you, yeah. you're forever thinking about them. Yeah. You'll never rest. Order leads to rest. The whole purpose of putting everything in order is so that now you can exist in a state of rest. You don't put your marriage in order, you'll never rest. You don't put your family in order, you'll never rest. You don't put your finances in order, you'll never rest. If you don't do something about your health, you'll never rest. So God rested on day seven, which is also what was, was also Adam and Eve, watch this, first full day of existence. So God's day seven was their first full day of existence. So that when Adam and Eve entered into their first day of existence, watch this, Everything was in a state of rest. God had prepared and created everything and put it into a state of rest before he placed man into it. Wow. 
Had it not been for sin, day eight would have also been a day of rest. Day nine would have also been a day of rest. Day 10, day 11, and so on. This has always been God's will that you and I put everything in order so that we can live lives in a state of rest. In the ancient world, rest is what resulted when a crisis had been resolved or when stability had been achieved, when things had settled down. It was like living free of obstacles rather than just doing nothing. Rest is not just doing nothing. A lot of people think rest is just doing nothing. Put your feet up and relax and do absolutely nothing. The Hebrew word sabbat, from which the word Sabbath comes from, has the basic meaning of ceasing. To sabbat, so sabbat means to cease from a certain activity which one has been occupied in. The seizing leads into a new state, which is described by the Hebrew words nuha and menuha. Nuha and menuha involve a mean being in a position of safety, security, and stability. And so the whole purpose of God's creation was to take tohu and wabu, without form, void, and darkness, and then to speak his word into it and transition it into a place of nuha and menuha, rest, where there is safety, stability, and security. Wow. We're not supposed to be stressing out. Why do you think Jesus said, come to me all you uh, who labor and are heavy laden? What's the, what's the meaning of that? This is what I think he was trying to say. He's saying, Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden. In other words, yes, you're supposed to labor, but you were never created by God to be heavy laden. Never. God never created the work so that we can be heavy laden by it. If we understand the principle of the ordered system, where we are being and doing what God created, you will never get to a point of being heavy laden. Wow. What does Paul say? He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Where's he writing that from? Prison. How can he write language so encouraging and so powerful? He understood the principle of rest. Wow. Jesus is in the boat in the storm, and I think it's in the Gospel of Matthew, or Mark, he adds a couple of extra words. He says, and he is sleeping, and Mark adds, I think it's Mark, on a pillow. And you ask yourself, why was that put in the text? <laughs> was to emphasize his sleeping. As, a, as a, if he was a child, so everyone else around him is stressing and they're screaming and the storm is raging and there is Jesus sleeping with his head on a pillow. Oh, that's right. Not being affected by my external circumstance. Yeah, it affects me, but not to the point that I'm stressing and heavy laden over. Wow. Temples in the ancient world were considered symbols of the cosmos. For example, in the Egyptian temples, the floor represented the earth and the ceiling represented the sky. Columns and wall decorations represented plant life. Isaiah 66 verse 1 speaks about the elements of a cosmic temple. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? Isaiah is making a connection between the temple and rest and the temple and creation. A true temple is a place of rest. Watch this. Isaiah is declaring the cosmos as God's temple. And this is how Genesis 1 should be understood. Genesis 1 is describing the creation of a cosmic temple with all its functions and God is dwelling and ruling in its midst. And this is what makes day 7 so significant because God has now inaugurated the temple by taking up residence in his creation. And the most central truth for the creation account is that this world is a place for God's presence. He's everywhere. This represents a change that has play, taken place over the seven days of creation. Prior to day one, God's spirit was active over the dysfunctional cosmos 
God was involved, but he had not yet taken up his residence in his creation. But now creation is completed, and the temple is complete. And what does God do? He enters into his temple to rest. Wow. In Psalms 132, the psalmist broadens our biblical understanding of rest. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool, saying, Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling, saying, This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. The psalmist describes God's dwelling place, the cosmos, as his temple where he rests, but also where he is enthroned. He's not just resting, he's enthroned. So that when God ended his work, which he had done, God takes up his rest and he rules from his residence. When God rests in the temple, it means he is taking command. That's what it means to be enthroned. He is seated on his throne to execute dominion. Every king sits on the throne to execute dominion. And God comes into his temple to execute dominion. God rests, but he rests, watch this, from a position of dominion and power and authority. That is why God commanded Adam and Eve. When he said to them, go and subdue and have dominion, what he was saying to them, go and rest. But don't rest doing nothing. Rest by subduing and have dominion over everything that he had created for them and given to them to steward. Rest is not an activity. It is functioning from a position of dominion and authority. The Bible teaches us, watch this, that Jesus is still functioning as mediator, high priest, intercessor, and advocate. But all of these roles he is doing from a position of rest and dominion. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. That's symbolical power. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. When scripture says that Jesus has sat, has sat down, it doesn't imply inactivity. Sitting down speaks of a place of absolute dominion and rulership. When the Bible speaks of rest, it is not speaking just peace. It is speaking of a position of dominion and power and authority. So that when you are resting, you are resting from, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what it means to rest. <coughs> Hallelujah. You can sleep in the middle of the storm with your head on a pillow. That's rest. So that when Jesus says, come to me, and I will give you rest, he's offering us more than just peace and green pastures. Wow. Hebrews 4 verse 9 says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. God is not waiting on a people just to put their feet up. He's waiting on a people to enter their position of dominion and to rule from that place. This was and has always been God's desire for us. Now watch what Paul says about all of this, because Paul now takes Genesis chapter 1, and you read it in... Creation is in a state of rest, the serpent comes in, and straight away he challenges the word of God. The word of God is the articulated form of the will of God. You'll never know the will of God until you hear the word of God. And so when the word of God is speaking to us, it's articulating the will of God. And so the serpent comes in and now he challenges the word of God. God said, God saw. It was good. So he's challenging not just the word of God and the will of God, he's challenging the ordered system. He's trying to revert God's creation back to without form, void, and darkness. That's all you have to do. Just create some disorder and some dysfunction and watch the, the, the ordered system not explode, implode on itself. 
and sin comes into the garden. Now, the book of Genesis is, falls within the genre of historical narrative, and one of the key features of historical narrative is its theology. It's full of theology. And as I read through the book of Genesis and into the rest of Scripture, the key theology, or the main one that I see, is the redemptive hand of God, God's redemption. That begins in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. And God is now working his redemptive narrative through the entire scriptures. And part of that redemption is to restore everything back to order. So that it can enter into its rest. That's the ultimate goal of the redemption. Hallelujah. And so how does God do that? He does starts first through a particular man by the name of Abraham. Then he works himself through a particular people by the name of the nation of Israel. They come through a particular savior, who is Jesus Christ. They come through a particular people again, which is the church of Christ. And so you see this redemptive hand playing itself out through the entire book of Genesis and through the rest of Scripture. And then we come into the New Testament, and what does Paul have to say about all of this? Watch what he says. And you, he says, this is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. I'll read some of it. And you, Paul says, he made alive, he created, watch, that's Bara, who were dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, yours and my starting point in our salvation was we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. We were tohu and wabohu. We were without form, void, and darkness. There was disorder and dysfunction in our lives, in which we once walked according to the course of this world. There's the disorder. According to the prince of the power of the air, there's the dysfunction. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we also conducted ourselves, that's dysfunction, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires. And so God calls us, or saves us first by addressing first the disorder and the dysfunction in us. Verse 4, but God who is rich in his mercy, because of his great love with, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us, or created us, that's Barah, alive together with Christ. And so our starting point was disorder and dysfunction. And the gospel we heard the gospel. The word of God spoke into that disorder and that dysfunction. And out of that disorder and that dysfunction, as a result of that gospel call, came order. We are justified. We are imputed the righteousness of Christ. So that even though we still sin, God no longer sees our sin, but he sees the righteousness of his son. But after justification, there is now sanctification. Where God is now sanctifying and setting us apart. And that takes the rest of our lives. We get, he began a good work in us, continues that work. It's like a spiral. We get closer and closer and closer and closer to perfection, but we never quite get there. Because if we did, we never need the final stage of our salvation, which is glorification. And God comes in and he glorifies us when we die and perfects us in Christ. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creation. You and I are the creation narrative all over again. This time we'll be recreated in the image of Christ. He says, he is a new creation. God has not only recreated us, he's given us a new purpose and a new function. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. Before we believed in Jesus, each of us was void with our form and full of darkness. Tohu and wabohu. Our lives were dysfunctional. I don't know about yours, but mine was. And in disorder concerning the things of God. But as a result of believing and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, God recreated us and has continued to recreate us so that we can enter into our rest where we are living victorious lives, ruling and reigning God, Christ, in our hearts. That's what it means. Watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 teaches us that the new creation is this. Watch this. 
Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Wow. Who lives in you? What's the purpose of the temple? When God took up residence in you, God comes into us and he takes up residence in us. And when he entered into us to take up residence in us, watch this, he inaugurated us as a temple. To which Paul says, you are now the temple of God. Because the Spirit of God lives and reigns within you. He has brought order and now he is ruling and reigning from within you to bring you rest. Wow. Just, just let that sit with you. Don't you realize that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? We often use, I've heard that scripture quoted many times to challenge us to eat healthy lives, live healthy lives. What, it's, what, what Paul is saying is that you're the temple of God and God has now come into you. That's, that's the only reason why you're the temple of God is because in you resides the spirit of Christ. And he's ruling and reigning from within you. Wow. Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. How? From a position of dominion, power, and authority. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. What's God saying to you this morning? What is God saying to you this morning? Well, let's go back to the beginning. So allow the word of God to put everything in order. Romans 12, Paul says in verse 2, Be not conformed to this world. Don't go back to like all the disorder and dysfunction. But be ye transformed, recreated, watch this, by the renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind in what? Well, Chapters 1 to verse 11, chapter 11 are all about the gospel. It's Paul's thesis on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, don't be careful. Don't go back to that disorder and dysfunction. God is working and he's living in you, residing within you. He's saying, be ye transformed, recreated, rebarred by the renewing of your mind in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so... Put everything back in order. Bring the word of God. Position it so that it can transform you and put everything. Put your marriage in order. Put your health in order. Put your finances in order. Put your family. Put everything in order. Allow God to, put, to work in you to put those things in order. Why? So that now you can enter and rest. That doesn't mean that the hard times won't be there. It doesn't mean that you won't have valleys. It just means you're going to know how to navigate those aspects of our lives. Why? Because Christ lives in me. Hallelujah. You bow your heads with me. Just going to have our worship team just to come up and just, just draw near to the Lord this morning. Pastor Idiafi and Pastor Fia know my story. Many of you know the, the journey of the dream team to church. We bought the big movie theater, the Eight Village Eight movie theater, in 2009 by a miracle. I had been watching it for a while. It was empty for about four years. In fact, it had become derelict. And I felt the Lord say to me, do what Joshua did. Walk around the building seven times a day. So I did it for seven times a day, every day for seven months. <coughs> and to cut a long story, in fact, I, I walk around, had my hands on the building and on the gates, on the ground, and the security were walking around. They would say, what are you doing with your hands all over the building? And I said, well, um, I'm, I'm going to own this building one day. And they said to me, well, it's not even for, on the market. And I said, well, the, I felt the Lord said that we're going to own the building. And so I prayed for it and cut a long story short. We bought the building. We didn't get it for free. We bought it. Um, but with the building came a huge debt. And, and after four years, we managed to... Increase the church's income to a certain point, but, but we still were falling short in terms of what we needed to, to help finance this building. And we were the talk of the town. The small church 
um, had now purchased this huge building, and and when we went into it, we we had this debt, and so what we did, or what I did, to be honest, we went in by faith, but when we got in there, I panicked. I wasn't resting. I was stressing out. In fact, I stressed out so much, I ended up having heart surgery, open heart surgery. And they said it was because of stress. And um, so as a result of all of that, we lost the building. We were forced to sell the building. And I share my story in many conferences that I speak at. I couldn't find a hole deep enough to hide in the shame that came with that. And, and uh, yeah, I was feeling sorry for myself, and, the, and I felt the Spirit of the Lord say to me, why are you feeling sorry for yourself? You're not the only one that's carrying this. Look at your congregation. They're carrying it as well. And that gave me strength. And I, but I, I wrestled with God, and I said to the Lord, Lord, why is it that you gave me this building supernaturally, but miraculously, and now you've taken it away from us? Because we had turned the building into a business. We turned it into an event center where we had wedding, birthdays, and all those sorts of events so that we get the income. And the church did everything. All the chefs were from the church, the serving, everything. We did everything. And, and, and I went before the Lord on my face before God and cried out to Him. Why? Why did you do that? And, 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 and this is what the Lord said to me. He said, the Dream Center is not a business. It is a church. You are not a CEO, because that was on my card. I never had a card with senior pastor, I had a card with CEO. It says, you are not a CEO, you are the pastor of this church. And he took me to Genesis chapter 1. I'd read it so many times. So many times. But it took pain and anguish and, and, and suffering for me to see what, what was hidden in the text. And God said to me, in the beginning, when I created the heavens and the earth, I created an ordered system where everything was being and doing what God, what I created it to be and do. And this is what the Lord said. Now put everything back in order. We put the church back in order. TBN Pacific from Australia came to New Zealand looking for a church to broadcast globally on TV out of Australia. And we were the church that were recommended. Then Shine TV picked us up. And, um, and we're on Shine TV now on Sunday. I'm not saying this to boast. I'm just saying this is what God did as we put everything back in order. And as I, I began to read through the scriptures, I began to see things that I'd never seen before to the point that uh, we, we train our, our sponsors and preachers to go deeper into the scriptures because a lot of the gold of scripture is hidden. The word of God is both revealed, but most of it is concealed. And only those who diligently seek after the Lord will ever find that goal. And so we went deeper into the scriptures and we saw miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. I'll say to you this morning, I don't care where, what state you, your life is and your family or your marriage is in, if you commit this to the Lord, put it back in order. Allow God who is already in you to work through you, to work with you, to put everything in order. I believe you're going to rest from a position of dominion, power, and authority. The things you're stressing about, you were never created by God, saved by Christ, to be stressing over. Never to be labor and be heavy laden. No, we can be like Paul in prison, suffering, writing, encouraging his brethren. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Will you stand with me? We're going to sing this hymn. I'm going to pray, just pray for you all from here. But if you really, what's the time? If you really need prayer this morning, come to the front. Someone will come and pray with you, and and we'll see what the Lord has for us this morning. We're just going to sing.